Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast with Corey Heights. On today's episode, we have a very, very fun topic to discuss, and that is NILs. That is name, image, and likeness. And who we're talking to today is two members of the Virtus brand. And this is an agency that helps college athletes figure out these deals. They have a lawyer on staff to review them and work with university compliance offices. So we go through all of the basics and we get into some details about what NIL deals are and how they can benefit college athletes. We also talk about high schoolers and prep school uh, athletes and whether or not they can do NIL deals or not. We talk about some of the biggest deals that have happened, some quirky deals, and much more. So consider this NIL 101 uh, here in the Prep Athletics Podcast. If you like this, be sure to subscribe to us on the YouTube channel and all of the major podcasting platforms. And now, the podcast, which is entitled NIL 101. Enjoy. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights some battles I'm, I'm i'm not sure if they got us if they did maybe maybe so you will get better as a player during that year so it was kind of exciting like oh yes yeah, somebody wants me all right ryan and tom welcome to the podcast we're going to start out with a very basic question here to kind of set a baseline for the conversation but tom can you tell our listeners at the beginning here what an nil is Sure. So to, to keep it simple, it stands for name, image, and likeness. Um, and the change in direction has been that now um, athletes are able to profit off their name, image, and likeness, whereas previously they've not been able to. Um, so it could be something as simple as, um, you know, an, an autograph session while they're still in school, not when they're, when they've graduated, it can be doing a, a business promotion where a business will pay them a certain amount of money to make a social media post or an appearance or, um, a commercial or whatever that might be, but it's really, it's just a, a new world that's been opened up to athletes where they can actually profit now off of their name, image, and likeness through business deals, merchandise, um, and all different sorts of ways. When you say athlete, we're talking college athlete here. Are we talking NAIA, JUCO, NCAA, all of those leagues? Correct. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. So um, NAIA actually led the way and changed their rules before everybody else but now it's, it's across the board at all levels. Um, athletes can benefit off their name, image, and likeness at this point in regards to college. High school, it gets a little more convoluted, but definitely now for college. And when you say deals, like um, it seems like it could be a thousand different things. Can you expand yes. on what you mean so, by deals specifically? I know you said autograph sessions, sure. but like, um, it, yeah, expand on that a little bit. Okay, sure. I'll, um, I'll go through some of the, just a couple of examples of what we've done with athletes. So um, any, a simple one right now is merchandise. Um, so you can now athletes can set up their own brand um, and sell merchandise with their, whether it be their name, their image of them or their likeness of them on merchandise, they can now do that. They couldn't do that in the past. Um, we have athletes who partner with businesses that instead of potentially hiring an actor or a professional athlete or somebody, a coach, anybody like that to endorse their product, they can now hire the and pay the college athlete to be the star in that commercial. Um, there are businesses that are exchanging dollars or some sort of value for players doing social media posts. A lot of these athletes have significant social media followers and um, you know that's they'll pay the athlete to essentially promote their business or whatever they want on their social media accounts. Um, there's just a wide variety. There's, and the way that this is even trending now, there's appearance fees. You can pay athletes appearance fees. Um, some of these are tied to nonprofits um, that are doing community service and work for athletes. But um, there, there's so many different ways um, that athletes can now uh, earn compensation through their name, image, and likeness. So it's just a few examples. Yeah, and tell us about your company and how you aid athletes and, and tell us the name of the company, who's involved and, yeah. and what you guys do to help the athletes. Sure, so our company is called Virtus. Um, that's Latin for virtue and honor. Um, and really our company from the jump, we've set out to navigate um, with athletes the name, image and likeness process to make sure that 
the athlete stays safe, which I'm sure we'll hit on at some point. Um, the athlete earns. Um, the businesses stay safe and get what they're paying for and the universities stay within compliance. And so we really cover uh, everything, but our, our big deal, yes, we have a marketing team that goes out and finds business opportunities for athletes. Um, that's a big part of what we do, but a lot of it is um, compliance, uh, making sure that everybody stays within the guardrails of what's legal. Um, and when I say legal, it's really with the NCAA um, because at this point it's all legal, but um, to where nobody's eligibility is at stake. Um, and we really offer um, consulting services for athletes to make sure that they're maximizing their value um, while again, staying compliant. So if I'm so an athlete, we have, Oh, go I'm ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry. So, so yes, we work with athletes um, that will come to us and we'll partner with them to again, um, make sure that they're protected. So every business deal that or opportunity that may come through, they have a full legal team that's going to review that business deal to make sure that there's no um, fine print, uh, which we've seen, um, to make sure that the deal is fair, to make sure that it's not taking advantage of the athlete. Eyes on their value. Um, so that's a uh, that, that's that's a key. There's been many times when. Uh, a business opportunity will come in at a certain level. Um, and when once we see the deal, what the business is wanting, we'll help craft a deal that's more beneficial to the athlete. At the same time, we have businesses that reach out um, that, that say, hey, I want to do a deal with an athlete. So we help that business maximize their budget and get the most out of it as possible to where the business wins and the athlete wins and everybody stays safe in the process. Gotcha. So an athlete could do this on their own, but one, they might not get the best value. Two, they might miss something in the fine print. And three, they might be missing out on tons of businesses that would like to invest in them, but they'll just never be able to get in front of because it's a one-man shop. That's, that's can... correct. And NIL, is, and NIL is brand new right now. And so there's a lot of businesses that are hesitant because they've never worked with athletes before. They don't really know. They, they might want to get in, but they're kind of just dipping their toe in at this point. And so um, part of what we do is, is offer that confidence um, to the businesses that, yes, the, the athlete will perform um, their duties as per the contract um, and help g guide that process. Um, Ryan, did you have something to say on that? Yeah, and, and just to your first two points, Corey, uh, the protection piece of that is, is so vital um, because we're talking about uh, young people who have not been in a position where they've ever negotiated the terms of a contract or the terms of an agreement. So what we've found that it's extremely helpful to have, to have this third party voice that can say, no, you need to make sure that you have these certain terms within your agreement. And you need to make sure that within those agreements that you do take, take the pay close attention to the fine print. And it's simple things. Uh, it's uh, things, for example, like arbitration clauses, ensuring that every contract that we put forward to a player has an arbitration clause, simply because uh, we don't want our player, if there is a dispute, uh, we don't want our player ever to be on the public docket where somebody would be able to see it. So it's just a way, a level of protection. So that's, that's really what um, uh, that we're, our purpose is. That's what we're trying to do is to protect everyone involved. Let me ask you guys this. Corey, with Hey, go for it. Sorry. Um, with that, what we're really trying to accomplish as well is allow the athlete to focus on the classroom and their sport. Um, we've seen that they're, especially the more high profile athletes, but um, athletes of all levels are getting bombarded through Instagram direct messages, email, um, reaching out to their parents. And, and it's becoming overwhelming because as Ryan mentioned earlier, they've really not been through this before. They've been a They've been an athlete um, and a student um, and a son or a daughter. And, and diving into this world at age 18, 19, 20, 21, you know, it's, it's advanced business at this point. And so our goal is to take that pressure and that burden um, off the athlete as well to where they can really focus in on what they, are sh what they really should be focusing in on, which is school and performing and getting better at their craft instead of being bogged down um, with a lot of the day-to-day -day tasks necessary to do an NIL deal. Right. Let me ask you this. Let's, we're going to use the University of Kentucky basketball team just as an example throughout this conversation since we're all from Kentucky. 
uh, and know that program. Say I'm a player at Kentucky and I want to do a deal. And, and this can be for any uh, Power 5 program. Do I need to run that deal by someone in the basketball or the athletic department to get approval first? Yes. Um, Ryan, do you want to take them through that? Do you want to take everybody through that process with working with compliance? Yes. So uh, for, we're going to use the University of Kentucky as an example. Uh, and and uh, the, what the program that the University of Kentucky uses is similar to what many other colleges use. So the University of Kentucky has a program called the Influencer App. And what that does is allows uh, players, um, whether they go and find the deals on their own or whether uh, the deals are brought to them by somebody else, that allows them to upload that to this influencer program. Once it's uploaded, the compliance department within the University of Kentucky will look at it, whether they'll approve it or they won't approve it. And, and that, is, that is the level of compliance um, through the influencer app that is currently at the University of Kentucky. So it will all go through this, uh, the, this program. What we've seen though uh, is that um, it can still go through that app, but it has not, the contract itself has not been reviewed, meaning that um, there's still uh, the possibility that uh, deals that are not the most favorable to the player or the student athlete um, are approved. Um, so that's why it's our belief that our role is vital in this to have an independent person reviewing these contracts to ensure that the terms are the most favorable to the student athlete and, and um, are protecting the university by remaining compliant with the guidelines that we're working under, currently working under with the NCAA. Ryan, give me an example of uh, a deal that the university compliance office would, would turn down. <laughs> I, the, maybe a better question is a, a, a deal that they would approve because we've seen a wide range of deals that uh, have been, been approved. And, and um, so, uh, but I can speak to what I know for sure would not be approved. If you were to go out and to make a deal, we're in Kentucky. If you were going to go out and make a deal with Maker's Mark, can't do that. Uh, if you were going to go and make a deal with Kingland um, Racing, can't do that. It's associated with gambling. So we know the entities that you are off limits. We know you can't make a deal with gambling. You can't make a deal with alcohol, tobacco, or firearms. You can't make a deal with uh, um, adult industries. Uh, so we know that those deals would get kicked out. So being me uh, based out here in Colorado, if someone from CU wanted to strike a deal with a marijuana company or a CBD company, not going to happen. Okay. Not going to happen. Okay. Perfect. Has now, have players uh, tried that uh, yet? Uh, there's been some, there's been some clever deals actually um, in ways to kind of, you know, circumvent somehow um, with some deals nationally where they're loosely affiliated maybe with an alcohol company mm -hmm. um, somehow, but there's no athlete that is, um, you know, making a social media post on behalf of Bud Light, mm -hmm. you know, or something like that. It's, it's not at that level. Um, and then, and something I did want to get to quickly as well is um, you mentioned a university that might be a power five university all the way down to NAIA schools, there are rules in place where if you do an NIL, or an NIL deal, you do have to, for example, at the NAI level, you have to let the athletics director know um, that that deal is taking place. So whatever level it is, it does have to be submitted through the university, um, whether through the compliance department or the athletics department, no matter what level you're in. It's, it's not just freewheeling and doing everything on your own. It does have to be submitted to the schools at any level. But guys, take, take a program like Alabama with all those studs on the football team. I mean, you're going to have to have a lot of compliance officers going through all these deals, right? That, that's right. Mm -hmm. So if I'm seeing uh, something coming to from Virtus, I probably know in compliance, oh, this is probably already checked off the box. I can fast track this. Is that kind of what you guys are Correct. proposing? Well, thank you. Yes. So through <laughs> our due diligence and, and again, having in-house counsel like Brian Maxwell is, is huge. Um, we've actually, you know, we're a, uh, example on how you do contracts and um, through some open records requests um, with some contracts that we've done that have gone through um, a university, a certain university, they actually chose our um, contracts as 
an example to be to be shown to everybody. And that's again one of the advantages of working with you know, a company that has their stuff together. And if I could back up to a point you were you were making, and it's a um, important to make this distinction because it's different from university to university as it currently sits. Um, for example, and I'll throw it, throw this name out here. Uh, uh, some universities will allow student athletes to be uh, to endorse Barstool. Well, uh, Barstool is associated now with sports books, so some universities say that's too close of a relation, um, and we're not going to allow it. And other universities, being more lenient, say, okay, we are going to allow it. So it really is a university to university athletic department directive. Uh, that dictates the bounds that we're playing in. And I was curious about that because at CU, Colorado University, the basketball team and the women's team play in the Coors Event Center, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm curious, like, is CU going to say, hey, if you're going to do any deals on with Coors, it's okay. Is that a school by school rule, Ryan? Or is that an NCA rule? No, that, that is a school by school. And, and in fact, what we are currently working under, and I'm sure we're going to get to uh, later on, is an executive order that essentially says that these are the prohibited uh, um, businesses you cannot make deals with. So it, it's going to be a school by school, state by state issue. And see the marketing side in me, if I'm, a, Tom, you'll appreciate this, but if I'm a small JUCO in the middle of Wyoming and there's a marijuana dispensary in our town, I'm going to make national news from my JUCO and say, Hey, our team is sponsored by, you know, ABC cannabis and not that my players are doing it. They're not allowed to do it, but we're, you know, we've got to deal with them. And that would be such a firestorm that everyone would know that school's name. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's why I was curious if that's a case by case basis. Cause I can see some teams using this, maybe uh, whether it's gambling, whether it's with um, a, a school that, or alcohol beverage, like the school, you know, brew club makes or, you know, something like marijuana or CBD, I can see a school somehow making the controversy a good thing for them. Now, once again, I need to reiterate this. Is that an athletic department rule or the NCAA through your executive order, Ryan, try to shut all that stuff down? No, well, so if, if we can probably get to this now, uh, it's, it's important to understand where we have come from to where we are now. It, it's the NCAA currently is, is, is saying pretty much hands off. They're, they're right now they're playing they're on the sidelines watching and seeing how things uh, pan out. So uh, for example, in Kentucky, we're working under an executive order. It's not actually a law. Uh, so we're being guided by the uh, um, university's compliance departments as well as knowing that through the NCAA, what we are doing cannot be considered an inducement. It cannot be performance-based, meaning it can't be if you get 10 tackles on the football field, you get an extra $5,000. Uh, and it has to be a quid pro quo, meaning if you're going to pay a player or you're going to compensate a player for something, they have to give you something in return. So those are essentially the guidelines that we're working on. The specifics as to you can't deal with uh, an alcohol, tobacco, firearms, or adult industry, or, or, or a gambling, that is, that is really the directive from the state that we're getting. And, and, it, and in fact, it's not even a law, it's an executive order. And will each state come out with different laws, and some may be more lenient to help their programs? Exactly. So uh, what's happened is California really was on the cutting of edge of this, and you know, California is so, uh, you know, with the child, uh, the child actor laws, where uh, young people were, were able to make money for years and years and years off their name, image, and likeness. They, they were out in front of all this and, and were the um, most lenient. And then you have more restrictive states. Uh, but frankly, um, through conversations with um, other attorneys that are working in this, uh, this area, uh, we actually believe that what will eventually happen will be it will be federal legislation uh, potentially federal legislation, and then it will be uh, the NCAA directing conferences on uh, what the actual rules of NIL will be. So it will be federally under the federal umbrella, and then conference by conference is what so, we ultimately believe will happen. Gotcha. Now, since it's the wild rest right, wild west right now, and there's not many guidelines, what's the worst case scenario that can happen with laws and guidelines that come down from federal and NCA? 
Uh, well, here's my belief. The more restrictive they are, uh, limiting you in the areas or the amount uh, that uh, um, young people or student athletes are able to make, I think a restriction on the amount of money uh, that a young person would be able to make would probably is a worst case scenario. Gotcha. Uh, Tom, quid pro quo. You have to do quid pro quo in all these deals. Uh, if someone just wants to give money to a kid, what's like the least amount of quid pro quo a, a player would have to do um, to justify uh, getting paid? Well, and this is again where I, where I defer to Ryan Maxwell, but it'd be my understanding that even an appearance, um, an appearance fee um, would be, you know, as, as I guess as easy as it could be, depending on what that is. I mean, just, you know, when you think of an appearance, you think of somebody maybe speaking in front of a crowd or maybe showing up to a big event to add value to that event or whatnot. But I would say that that would be as, as lenient as it would be. Yeah, and I would agree with you 100%, Tom. It, the situation that we're in is that really nobody understands what the value of it. What, how much is an Instagram post uh, worth? Well, it's worth what the business is willing to pay for it. Uh, and that's, the, that's the, the kind of the situation that we're living in now. So a quid pro quo uh, is pretty much... Uh, how much money are you willing to pay for an Instagram post or, or, or Twitter post, whatever the case may be. So it's, it's, we're establishing that now. Gotcha. Okay. Since this is a prep school based podcast slash YouTube channel. Um, and that's our main clientele here. Can you guys break down how high schoolers or potential prep school players or postgrads can take advantage or at least what advice you would give them to start thinking about when it comes to NIL and maybe their futures? So, Ryan, if you want to hit the legal part of it, and then I'll give the uh, what advice would you give them? So, as far as it goes for the high school athletics, it's st and again state by state. So, your uh, high school athletic association uh, has bylaws, and within those bylaws, it will state whether or not a high school athlete is able to make money off of the name, image, or likeness. For example, Kentucky, a high school athlete is unable to make money off of their name, image, and likeness. California, conversely, you are able to make money off of your name, image, and likeness. So it goes by a state by state issue, uh, state by state. Um, I, I can, off the top of my head, um, it's and it's different all around. For example, Michigan is a lot like Kentucky, where uh, high school student athletes are not able to make money unless you, uh, the individual, can petition the high school athletic uh, um, association. So it's different from state to state. Yeah. Um, and, and then in regards to, you know, advice and preparation and Corey, we can dive into a little bit about uh, prep schools for a second. Um, they are not a part, many of them are not a part of their state associations. Um, in which case, um, Ryan Maxwell, unless I'm mistaken, um, that it, it essentially would make an athlete ineligible with their state high school association if they did an NIL deal. However, if you play for you know, uh, a team that is not a part of the uh, state association, you actually could do NIL deals at that point. And we've seen, for example, Mikey Williams is, is famous um, and has been cashing in on his name, image and likeness because he's not playing for a, you know, a state association school. He can still continue to play. And with different leagues popping up, like Corey, you and I talk about overtime, we, you know, and just all the different things going on that becomes less relevant for, for players at that level that are choosing to go that route. Now, in regards um, to advice and preparation for this, um, there's many reasons why I think that NIL is a great thing. Um, some personal reasons, um, personal for the athlete themselves and be able to help that. But one of the reasons is um, businesses want to do business with um, a brand, an athlete brand that is positive. And so what we're finding is, is that um, athletes are actually being motivated to be on their best behavior um, mm -hmm. and to put forth a brand that is going to be, um, you know, acceptable to businesses and to the masses. And this actually doesn't, it does have something to do with um, on the field or on the court play, but actually there's quite a few people that have large social media followings that are not the best players in the country, but they're interesting. 
Um, they might have a YouTube channel or a TikTok or an Instagram or Twitter or, or any number of social medias that for whatever reason has been interesting and they've grown a following and they might be the backup tight end. Um, however, because of that and because of that reach, businesses are willing to partner with them on NIL deals just because of their following. And so um, I would tell any athlete watching this or anybody that's trying to, that would want to help an athlete prepare for college, prepare, prepare for their NIL, is be very aware and intentional of your brand um, at all times. And that typically means best behavior. It typically means um, even showcasing that good behavior, community give back. One of the things that we talk to our athletes about when they come on with Virtus is that um, we want to assist them in becoming legendary, which is different from just being a, a great athlete. Um, when you're a legend, that means that you're tied into your community. Mm -hmm. That means that people um, associate themselves with you and connect with you on a level deeper than just what you do on the court or on the field. Um, that's the different level. And so um, being mindful of that, it, it's a, it is a different type of approach, but all athletes that are interested in wanting to um, make money and earn off of their name, image, and likeness should really start to take that into account, their behavior on the court and their behavior off the court and how intentional they are with those things. That's excellent. That's excellent. It's just like we say to, um, you know, middle schoolers, hey, coaches start looking at your grades in ninth grades. You cannot hit your freshman year and have hiccups. You've got to start from day one and stay consistent with that. So I like what you're saying about this, your brand, think about it. Um, great advice. Let's ask you, let me ask you this now. Is NIL, is that becoming part of college's uh, recruiting pitches? To, yeah, to, to a certain level. As Ryan Maxwell mentioned, it's, uh, it, it can't be used as an inducement, uh, meaning a coach um, isn't supposed to be able to call an athlete and say, um, we will do $250,000 in NIL deals if you come to our school. Um, however, what some smart people around these programs are doing separate from the school are um, starting to do um, various forms of, uh, whether it be a collective, a group of businesses, business people coming together to say, hey, we are going to commit, um, in the case of like the Texas Longhorns, for example, we're going to commit $10 million towards NIL deals. We don't know who the athlete's going to be. But we do know uh, we're sending this message across the country to these athletes that if you come to Texas, we're serious about it. We have money waiting for NIL deals. Um, and so th there's various ways that they're doing that. There's, uh, of course, Alabama, Ohio State, several others. They made splashes very early on um, with some of their key players. And I, when I say that school, I actually mean businesses around that school um, made those splashes early by doing and I, large in some cases, seven figure NIL deals with athletes just to show, hey, um, the people around this university, the businesses and the fans around this university want to attract the best of the best. So if you come here, these are the types of deals that would be possible once you arrive on campus. Um, so that's that's the way it's, it's supposed to be going. Um, I'm sure that there's some gray area um, going on that will be brought to light at some point, but but that's the way it's going. And um, this is, it's hard to even call it the future. This is the right now, actually. And so what you're going to see is you're going to see some schools that um, accept this and latch onto this very quickly, and they will be way ahead of the game. And we're going to see some schools come out of nowhere that a year ago, nobody thought could ever be a contender in import. And they are going to fly past a lot of established universities because of their acceptance of this. Conversely, you're going to see some schools that have potentially been like traditional powers that are trying to hold off on this, trying to kick this can down the road as much as possible or out and out really just in various ways, try to stop it. And you are going to see them go the opposite direction um, because this is happening. And we're seeing it. A great example is what Deion Sanders is doing. Um, he pulled in the number one, uh, recruit in the entire country, um, followed up by the number four wide receiver in the entire country. And you just, you know, th if that doesn't smack everybody in the face to say that this is real, this is happening, and this is not really the future like a year, two years down the road, this is the future right now is what's happening. Um, and again, the schools that 
adopt this now um, and accept it as the way it is um, are going to do very well. And you could see the next Gonzaga uh, born from a school of similar size, random somewhere in the country, just because of their acceptance of this. And it can happen very, very quickly. I believe it will. Did Deion Sanders get those kids through NIL deals or the promise of them? Yeah, I mean, so I obviously don't have the knowledge. I'm not trying to put him out there like that. I would say that, you know, there's obviously businesses around him that are very aggressive with that because that, I mean, it was out there around NIL deals. Like in the figure, seven figures were discussed and it was put out on ESPN. It was put out everywhere. Um, that that was the level of, of um, earning potential or earnings that that young man is going to make at that university. And so I can't say that, you know, obviously that'd be a violation if uh, Coach Prime is actually negotiating and making those deals happen himself. So I doubt that was the case, but there was somebody very close to the program, um, which by the way, is, is legal. It's legal to do that, Ryan Maxwell. Am I, if, if you're a business owner and you're not associated with the university, you can, I mean, it, it, you can talk with people about, hey, you know, we have this much money set aside and um, how that actually comes out in the news and how that is reported might be different um, than how it actually went down. Um, because obviously it's, you know, it's going to draw a lot of eyes and ears if you say this player went to this university because he had seven figures in NIL deals. Mm -hmm. um, but I... You would have to say that those NIL deals or the potential of those NIL deals is how he pulled in a recruiting class like that. But I'm going to assume that it was all on the up and up. Yeah. The only, only way that it becomes impermissible is if there is coordination between the business and the university. Uh, it has to be the business alone. There cannot be any coordination, no direction from the university. That's the legal stance, Ryan. But we both know that there are backroom deals still happening with this. So. Uh, well, yeah. I, so I'm sure. This, <laughs> so, so th this move, those um, backroom deals, and it's and it's well documented um, of players who maybe receive cash payments, um, deposits, whatever that might be, getting into issue with uh, taxes and you know wire fraud and and all of these different things. So um, the backroom deals are now being moved. You know, if I'm a if I'm a, a top athlete in the country and somebody comes to me about a cash deal under the table, there's no need for me to risk my eligibility anymore. There's no need for the school to risk any sort of issues anymore. Mm -hmm. um, all of these things should be done legal and above board at this point. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but that is one of the positives of NIL. Yeah. Let's is that there's no more. Absolutely. Tom, I want you to discuss the deal that happened with the two top players that went to Memphis um, Amani Bates and the other kid, um, they had the option of overtime, the G League, overseas, or going to Memphis, and they chose Memphis. Why don't you explain why that was the smartest deal of those four? Yeah. Um, well, first and foremost, the earning potential, you know, amongst all of those, um, now actually college is where you can earn the most. Um, and I thought it was great for um, FedEx to make such a splash. Um, that's good for all players. I know that there might be jealousy and different things that go on, but the reality is the bigger deals in the NIL world that happen, um, that sets the market. The market is being set right now. Mm -hmm. And so um, obviously to go play for Penny Hardaway and Larry Brown um, and that staff and to learn from that staff, to learn what it means to be a pro, to learn the game, especially as young as they are, because both of those young men reclassified actually. Um, and I believe he just turned 18 this school year. And so they get to learn, they still get the college experience. Um, obviously Corey, it, you know, we've been to enough, um, a great college basketball uh, a game. Like the, it's really difficult to duplicate that level of atmosphere. Um, and I think it does prepare. So now they're learning, they're starting to get their education. And they received um, more money through one NIL deal than they would, um, you know, with a couple of years in the G League um, or, you know, quite a few, quite a bit of time spent at the overtime. And so um, I thought it was fantastic. Um, and and a, again, a, a big splash early on for NIL for everybody. Yeah, I thought that was fantastic for them. And I want to I want to dig deeper on what you mentioned about the locker room. Say you've got guys in a college locker room that have bigger deals than other guys and we're probably still too early to know 
the outcome of this, but do you foresee or what's your thoughts on potential locker room disagreements or tension among the team with deals at with kids at, at such a young age? Like when you get in the uh, pro ranks, you know, they're a little bit more professional with that, but with amateurs dealing with this and being 18 years old, sometimes what's your thoughts on how that's going to affect the chemistry within a team? It's, it's going to happen. It's going to affect. Um, thankfully, we, we've been blessed that some of the athletes that we've done these larger deals with, um, like, you know, the six figures and beyond um, business opportunities are just top notch human beings. Um, and so uh, we actually didn't see or hear of any of that. Um, and part of this NIO world is, um, you know, growing up for athletes, maybe a little bit quicker than they used to. Um, because typically when you reach the college level, you were the man in your hometown, you were the man in your little bubble. And then you get to college and you become the man a little bit more regionally, but now you're with a bunch of other alphas that are also the man. And you, and Corey as well documented the different, um, you know, things that athletes go through in their own locker room. If, if people are watching this and thinking that every locker room is just peachy keen, even the ones that look like it on the surface. I hate to burst your bubble, but it's not the case. That's been going on for years when it comes to playing time or thinking that the coach favors them or maybe they're the same position. Maybe uh, one assistant coach recruited a point guard and another assistant coach recruited a point guard. And so they're trying to get both those guys on the court for their own job. All these things have been going on for a very long time. Well, um, again, thank you. We've been working with, um, we believe, really high character people that um, we didn't, we've not heard of any, but it's going to happen. It's probably already happened um, and it will continue to happen, but it's just the next level of maturity for everybody um, to learn, uh, you know, that this is how it works. And so work, this is, you know, and, and by the way, we, we have had, I will share, we have had athletes come to us that we work with that maybe aren't as high profile. Um, so what we'll do on their behalf is, okay, let's get a game plan together to where you can grow your influence. Let's try to look at something a little bit different um, because you know, you're on the field performance. Maybe the position that you play is not naturally conducive to the, the historical big deals, but let's work on your personality. Let's work on maybe you utilizing your social media to interview other players, to show your personality, to bring out their personality and to grow your followers once the followers on your account jumps, then we can go to businesses and negotiate larger deals. And so, you know, the emotions are going to come, um, but they, they've always been there, Corey, and you know that. And so this is just another one that needs to be managed properly, um, but it is going to be there good and bad. And if I could add to that, I think that that also uh, it goes to the value of a company like Beer Juice as well, is because uh, the possibilities of profit within the locker room are far less when the player is not even focused on getting those deals or working those deals. When somebody else is doing that for them, it's not the top of conversation every day because he's not focused on it. He's not hyper-focused or she's not hyper-focused on it. So I think that also speaks to the benefit of having someone outside of the locker room who is going and working for these student athletes. Yeah, perfect pitch there. Let's move back to the prep school guys real quick. Um, and I want to give you an example here. You tell me if it's got legs or not. Say I'm going to do a post-grad year in a small town in New England, and I want to practice my negotiating skills, my contract skills, um, my social media skills. Could I, in theory, walk into the local sandwich shop and say, hey, uh, I would like you know, to work a deal with you. I'll do 10 social media posts for 10 sandwiches over the course of, of four weeks. Um, we'll write up a little contract, you negotiate back and forth on it, and bam, the deal's done. If, if, if you're in a prep school and under no association rules, you could technically do that, right? Yes. Yes, you could. Okay. As long as it was, yeah, yeah, yes. And is that something you, to me, from my point of view, I'd recommend kids doing that because it's very small, but you're at least, you're at least starting that foundation of having a conversation with a real life business person, mm -hmm. working on a basic contract, negotiating. Right. Maybe you want 20 sandwiches instead of 10. Maybe the business owner only wants to give you five. Like to me, I see these as being little baby steps to where when you do get to college, uh, you're just not doing this for the first time. Yeah, I think it's great, Corey. One of the things that I would recommend though is um, keeping it as simple as possible right now because you know we, 
proper paperwork when it comes to these NIL deals um, is not, you know, a, one paragraph. Um, there's a lot of different things that come with this. And so I'd also say, you know, um, keep everything as simple as possible while you are learning. Um, if you're going to do this because you'd hate to, you know, get into some kind of legal battle over five sandwiches that you think that you were owed, you know, when you made your 10 posts. So just keep it simple at this point. Um, but yes, I, I do think that it is, this is a great way to, you know, to, to educate everybody on how the real world works. I just see this as being like a great extracurricular class at a post-grad year. Uh, I don't know if it's, it falls into on entrepreneurship or what, but Hey, you know, we got 15 kids in class, go in the community and try to make a deal. We'll go over contracts. We'll go over negotiations. We'll bring in the business owners and talk to them. And you know, whether they're going to do this in college or not, what a great life skill to have. I think so. And, and, you know, Corey, I, part of what we are getting into now is the education side of it. Um, there are some uh, post-grads um, and uh, large teams that, frankly, they do pump out superstars. They pump out, you know, high major division one, division one players, future NBA players, and they will be dealing with this the next year. And frankly, it, part of it might come up during their recruiting process. Um, so it is, you know, something where people do need to get more familiar with this and, uh, and learn as much as they can, because it's, it's out there that this is, um, simple and, and it's just not as simple as everybody would like to be, um, when you start to get into contracts and, and, and somebody delivering on a contract that they signed and then the expectations of the person that put that contract in front of them gets very convoluted very quickly, even over a very small amount of money. Mm -hmm. And Tom, we're not, and Corey, we're not even uh, touching the tax implications that we're talking about when these student athletes start earning money and, and how uh, they need to be protected or, or, or alleviate those tax burdens as much as possible and how they can do that, um, which is a topic uh, that deserves its own podcast. <clears throat> but those are just, you, you know, you have your contract negotiations but once you make that money, are you getting paid as an individual or has somebody done their due diligence and set up a business for you? Are you an LLC yourself uh, where uh, in order that you can alleviate some of those tax burdens? So um, it, it is it is far more com complicated than uh, than simply going out and saying, I'm going to uh, uh, for exchange for a hundred bucks, I'm going to give you an Instagram post and then we're going to you're going to pay me as the individual. Well, that's income and you're going to get taxed on it. So, you know, these are all concerns that have to be addressed as well. I'm assuming you have all your clients to create their own, own LLC. That is correct. Okay. Uh, we, do, we do that. We bring a client in, we will form an LLC for them. And so the endorsement deals are actually made between the business and the LLC itself. So the business will pay the LLC. Do you guys incorporate in Delaware and Nevada or do you guys incorporate in the state that the student resides in? We, we don't advise our clients on where they are to register. For example, we have several clients who are from the state of Florida. Um, I will take a client from the state of Florida any day and tell them that, you know, that that's the place to, to, to uh, register your LLC because you're uh, not getting uh, your income tax. Uh, so uh, it, it really is a case by case basis, um, depending on the student athlete. Guys, tell me, tell me situations uh, where NILs don't work. I know the military academies, like my alma mater of Air Force, you cannot do it. I know some foreigners are having issues with their visa, which we talked about, Tom. Tell me who cannot do an NIL deal. Well, Tom, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll take the uh, um, students yeah. on the F-1 visas first. Uh, so currently, as it stands, that if you are on an F-1 visa, um, you cannot make money <clears throat> for your uh, name, image, and likeness unless uh, you file for an exemption. And the way that works <clears throat> is that you are able, if you file um, through the Department of State, uh, an exemption on your F-1 visa, you can make money if you are doing it in the area of your study. So for example, if you are a communication major, it's, it's, um, it's plausible that as a communication uh, major, you would need experience on being a spokesperson so you can make money as a spokesperson endorsing a product. 
Uh, that's how it st currently stands, uh, but you have to file that exemption. Um, and that is a process that takes time uh, and, and, and guidance to, to do that. So that's how the F-1 visa program works now. It seems like if I'm recruiting a foreign player that's going to be on a visa, we're just going to tell them, look, you're going to be a communications major as minimal as possible. And then you minor in what you really want to do. And then I guess within near amount of time, guys like you, Ryan, are going to have the exemption. I'll figure it out and have a boilerplate for it. Mm -hmm. That's correct. But just right now, you're starting for the first time. So a player we mentioned, uh, Tom, is Oscar Shibwe, who's arguably having one of the best performances in college basketball this season. He's a big man for Kentucky. But even though he's having such a stellar season, since he's on an F1 visa, he cannot take advantage of this. You want to explain a little bit more about that? You, you just said it. And, and to follow up with what Ryan said, that's why he can't earn at this point. And um, Oscar's obviously been just an exemplary human being uh, throughout this whole process. He's still sticking around after games and signing autographs just for free, just, mm -hmm. to, just to help people. Um, to make them feel special that, but that's the way Oscar's always been. Um, and, you know, I, I, I have a feeling that he'll get that worked out at some point. Uh, if anybody would need an exemption or deserve an exemption within the state of Kentucky, I think he's got to be at the top of the list. Um, and, you know, something come, came across our plate today that we do need to talk about and it actually goes to Oscar is, um, and why you need to be careful in this space it was brought to our attention that um, somebody's actually making bootleg Oscar t-shirts. Mm -hmm. Several times, <clears throat> a couple of times with our athletes, our, our really popular athletes that um, some third party somewhere um, makes t-shirts or gear with that athlete's name, image, and likeness on it with, without their knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so that's where, you know, having a, uh, full-time in-house counsel helps Ryan Maxwell will send a cease and desist and we'll take further action if necessary. But um, there's a lot going on out here with this stuff. Yeah. I used to, in college, I worked security at Red Rocks uh, amphitheater out here in Colorado. And my job is to be next to the stage. Cause I was, you know, six, seven, but my other buddy who was smaller, his job is to roam the parking lot and uh, confiscate all the, bootlegged band t-shirts so after the show he'd be like what size are you and we'd have, we'd all have these tie-dyed bootleg t-shirts that would be part of our payment <laughs> so that's been happening for for eons now so I'm not surprised to hear that tell me this tom off the top of your head and, and ryan if you know too uh can you give me some examples of some real unique or interesting deals that students across the uh country might have gotten that are kind of unique or quirky or interesting yeah, um, you know, as, as far as as far as interesting, I mean, for me, one of the reasons this was formed was for the personal. Uh, Corey, you know this about me, and you share in the same way. We're so pro athlete from a human perspective. Um, a lot of these athletes are looked at. It, it's almost like a video game. I'm, I'm still trying to find a better way to describe it, where they are just pawns on a screen to entertain people. Whereas um, we've been involved at the grassroots level for so long that you start to actually, you know, know these athletes and recognize that they're just like everybody else. They have great things going on in their life. And many of them have a lot of, you know, t very tough things going on in their life right now. And so to me, every single deal, um, it, it, I know this, this is not trying to be a cop out to your question, but every single deal to me is incredibly interesting because it is setting a market that I believe is going to change lives for so many people. Um, I won't get into any, any names or anything like that, but there was an athlete, a five-star athlete um, who signed their letter of intent um, a month or so ago. Um, and the same week um, family was getting evicted from an apartment um, the very same week. And so on the surface, again, from the, you know, entertain me, you're a pawn on television. Nobody actually really, seemingly would care um, and actually some people would be intimidated um, that a young man 18 years old could you know if if it was permissible um, and he wouldn't lose eligibility could have done one nil deal that changed his family's life forever you know a ten thousand dollar deal a twenty thousand dollar deal just for maybe signing some jerseys or whatever it might be sets his family on a totally different course and so to me, when I see the twins, uh, the two girls that play at Fresno that with the, uh, was it Boost Mobile? I think I thought that was great. 
Um, I think, of course, the FedEx deals I thought were fantastic. Um, you know, we, there's just been a lot going on. And I think they're going to get more unique. People are getting smart. They're understanding the guidelines. And I think that you'll see, I think part of the future is um, nonprofits that are able to essentially uh, pay athletes to do community service um, and, and really impact lives to where it's just wins all around for everybody. Everybody's winning in this scenario. Um, I think that there'll be, that that'll be coming down the line. Um, and, you know, we've done fun deals. Like one of our, our very first deal actually made, um, it, it was named the ESPN NIL deal of the week. And there's an offensive lineman at the University of Kentucky, Billy McCall. He's got this great magnanimous personality. Um, he's a defensive tackle, big guy, just, just dominates the middle. And uh, the first post is him um, sitting on a, you know, on a tractor. And it was just kind of, I mean, he's, you know, it, it, it went viral. Um, and again, ESPN named it its deal of the week. It was, and it was because it was quirky. It was completely unexpected. Um, the business loved it. Uh, Bully had a good time with it. And, uh, you know, but, but there's been, there's been quite a few of those. Mm -hmm. uh, if I can add another one, uh, we, we actually orchestrated a, a deal between a vet clinic and a, a current UK basketball player and his dog. He has a, uh, uh, emotional support animal. So the contract was actually between the vet clinic, the player and the dog, uh, to endorse the vet clinic. So that was an interesting one. And to Tom's point about, um, uh, partnering with nonprofits, uh, we were able to do that on, on, with our first client and to show the impact that NIL can have is, uh, we were directed by our client to partner with a, a, a nonprofit that he and his father had started. And, um, uh, within several months of working with him, we were sitting across from the Senate president of the Kentucky general assembly, uh, where we were getting assurances from the general assembly that they would take up their issues and actually make a positive change in our in our community. So what we're seeing is in NIL is not just a money grab, and it shouldn't be considered as just a money grab. It should be a way to empower athletes for them to be able to see that, hey, my value is much more than what I do on the field. My value is as an individual is what how I can make a positive impact in my community. So we were fortunate to work with a student athlete from the very beginning who saw that and was able to affect positive change. So it's not just a money grab. And I, and I think that that's an important uh, note to make that, that it really is about a way for, uh, for student athletes to be empowered to see their value as an individual. I love that. That's a great story, Ryan. Thanks for sharing that. That's, that's good mm -hmm. intel. I never even thought of that before. Mm -hmm. So um, we're talking about the big sports here, basketball and football. Can smaller sports like golfers, swimmers, tennis, do they have marketability out there? And Tom, is it, if they're interesting and have like some personality to it, is it the same thing with the smaller sports sports as it is the bigger sports? Yeah, it, it is. And, and um, I believe there's a gymnast from, I believe LSU that's one of the highest earners in NIL mm -hmm. to date. Um, and, you know, with each of those sports that aren't, you know, the, the big two or big three, you know, there is a, a large, uh, portion of people that still follow that and businesses that directly support that. So whether you're on the tennis team, there's massive uh, manufacturers of equipment um, and other, you know, things that there's a, there's a huge following in tennis, for example, huge following in golf. There's a lot here. Now they've not been prioritized as of yet. As I mentioned early on, I think the businesses are, everybody's taken somewhat, I should say everybody, but most, a majority have taken kind of a wait and see approach on how all this works and how this pans out. Is this done correctly? Did the athletes win? Is there any major scandal? Is there anything, you know, everybody's still trying to kind of figure this out. Um, but we're seeing more and more um, the, you know, more businesses come to the table, recognizing how important this is um, to frankly, you know, boost their business. Um, you know, most of these businesses are fans of a certain university that they are doing these deals with. But what we found with each business that we work with is that they actually do receive marketing power from doing these deals because of the appreciation that the fan base has um, for them investing in an athlete. Because what that does is that makes th that university more attractive for other athletes to come. And the fans know they'll get better players if everybody's going in on these NIL deals. Uh, if they're better players, it's a better product on the court. 
um, which means everybody's happy at that point. And so, um, so far, businesses have been very happy um, doing these deals, um, and we expect more to come. And, you know, it's going to reach every niche. It is going to reach, you know, baseball will be big. The women's sports will be huge. I, I actually believe that the women's sports will be just as big as uh, the men, if not bigger. Um, and that's all coming down the pipeline very quickly. Oh, that's great. Uh, let me ask you about a specific example here to a kid in Kentucky and his future marketability. And that player is Reed Shepard. Now, Reed Shepard is one of the top guards in the class of 2022. He's 22, right? Not 23? Oh, he's 23. Okay. So Reed Shepard's one of the top players in 23. His father, Jeff Shepard, played at Kentucky, 1998, uh, Final Four, most valuable player played in the NBA for a few years and pretty good businessman as well. And Reed is, is being touted and the rumors I've heard is being one of the most marketable players that will be uh, in NCAA in a few years. You and I know, and Ryan, you know about uh, Kentucky uh, basketball fandom. And I think most people listening to this do as well, but what makes Reed Shepard so marketable for NIL purposes? Yeah. So there's a couple of things with Reed. First of all, this is this is a personal one for me. I, I've had the privilege of knowing Reed since he was in kindergarten and watching him play as a first grader, play up against fifth graders, and not just hold his own, but be one of the best players on the court. Um, but Reed um, and his family are just, they're absolutely incredible people. Um, and I, I'm not trying to sound cliche. They really are very genuine um, Reed is starting to show his personality a little bit, but he's already had it. They're clever, they're funny, um, and they're just phenomenal people. Now, what may we just got to see with one of our clients, um, not only are they great off the facing people off the field, not only are they very, very good on the field or on the court, but staying in your home state and staying with that home school in your home state, being from there, is going to be something that I think is going to change. And it's going to, um, you'll start to see quite a few athletes go ahead and stay home um, because that increases their marketability um, multiples um, if you decide to stay home. Um, and I think we're going to see that. And I think Reed has the potential to be an example of that, actually, um, to where everybody will look around and say, man, I'm, you know, I'm staying home. Um, if you're the number one football player in the country and you're from, uh, you know, College Station, you might want to stay at A&M um, for those deals, for that stuff. Whereas in the past, you know, maybe some kids want to get away from home a little bit more. Uh, they might want to travel. They might want to get outside of their state. I think this will keep people <clears throat> more at home. But on top of Reed being really good at basketball, on top of them being amazing people, um, their whole family and the reputation that they have, um, staying in your home state and committing to the home state school is going to be the reason why his marketability is that high. If he would have chosen the University of Virginia, which was a great option for him, fantastic option, um, we would not be talking about his NIL status um, being as high as it is projected. Gotcha. Okay, thanks for sharing that. We've talked a lot about this today, guys. Is there anything about the NIL world we have not discussed yet or you think we need to go over um, before we end this? Uh, well, yeah, I think... Oh, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I, I think um, Ryan Maxwell and I could dive into any one topic on NIL for hours. This is definitely the, the 101 info um, class. We're, we're very passionate about this. Um, and one of the things I'm really, I'm happy to see is that overall the response from the fans in regards to NIL has been pretty positive, uh, pretty overwhelmingly positive, actually. They like it, they get into it. Um, you do have some, you know, that on the front end, we're saying this is going to ruin sports. This is going to ruin athletics and whatnot. And, and you'll always have that. But I think um, everybody's enjoying it. A lot of these deals have been clever. They've been fun, random, and it's all just new. You know, over time, the market will level out um, in, in some way. It just, it will. Um, but we are just believers that overwhelmingly, this is a very positive thing for the personal reasons that we talked about earlier. Um and you're starting to see more and more people come around to the fact that, yes, this college athlete that might be 19 years old, he might make a million dollars while wearing that jersey. He might. Um, but they're also great kids. It's also changing their family's trajectory forever. Um, it takes away some of the worry of, 
you know, if a kid's going to be injured and not have a pro career um, and the, the tragic stories that we've heard in that realm. Um, but yes, it's, it's so far, it's been overwhelmingly positive and we're just really excited and feel super blessed to be able to work with these athletes um, who by and large are just great people, just, you know, big kids, young men and women um, trying to figure this out. And if I could just uh, add uh, from the attorney's perspective, um, advice to young people and their families, uh, it's do your due diligence. Don't just enter agreements because it seems attractive at the time, you know, $1,500 for a post on Instagram. Don't just do it. Make sure that you have someone who is reviewing these contracts. Make sure that they are the most favorable terms for you as a student athlete as possible. Make sure you are protected as a business. Make sure you're protected as a brand. So if I could just, my, my last message to you and to your audience would be as a student athlete, protect yourself, protect your brand, protect your business um, uh, the best way that you can. Yeah. And Ryan, if people have questions, where can they find you? Well, you can contact us at info at the uh, would be the easiest way to go about that. Or uh, my personal email is rmaxwell at the beertoothbrand.com. Tom? Yeah, same. Um, info at uh, the Virtus brand um, and T Bauer at the Virtus brand.com. No, I'm sorry. Tom at the Virtus brand.com. Nice. We'll just, for everyone listening, we'll put info at Virtus brand.com in the show notes. So if you want to reach out to these two guys with questions, you can absolutely do it. You. Uh, you can represent. Uh, players from any 50 states of the 50 states okay yes and okay. and uh there's also a lot of information it it really lists out the different services that we provide to athletes but each of those services are things that athletes need to take into account um, and businesses as well when they start to enter this world of nil um ryan talked about the uh the protection side of it most of the conversations, um, I'll have a lot of conversations with athletes. Um, they want to center around how much do you think I can earn? How much do you think I can earn? Um, and that is, you know, quickly uh, changed when we realize when we talk to them about the exposure and potential pitfalls um, that a lack of protection um, would bring. And so um, I would highly recommend everybody just check out our website, um, start to, you know, familiar, familiarize yourself with um, all the different things that we do, because those are things that you'll need to think about whether you work with Virtus, another company, or work with anybody at all. We've, um, the protection element is number one in what we talk about, although it's not always the most sexy, it, it should be, um, because you might be signing a $1,500 deal and think it's simple and small, but in the fine print, it says, oh, and by the way, we're able to use your name, image, and likeness for the rest of your life. That's exactly and right. those little things can be thrown in in so many different ways. Um, and, you know, very, very smart people would fall, would fall for that. And so it's not a matter of, you know, the intelligence. It's a matter of paying attention to the detail and staying protected throughout this. Yeah. And, you know, I do business on the outside as well in real estate and environmental cleanups. And in the old days, we hired a normal lawyer to try to figure out environmental law. And then we ended up paying a little bit more for an environmental lawyer. And that guy did environmental law every single day of the week. He knew all the regulators. He knew the judges. He knew the other lawyers. So while we actually paid more per hour for the guy that specializes in environmental law, we actually saved money in the long term because he was an expert in that field. So sounds like you guys are experts in the NIL field and you know it inside and out. And you would be just a great resource for people looking to, to potentially get into this. So... Perfect. Well, Ryan, Tom, thanks so much for joining us today and giving all of us uh, NIL 101 here uh, on the Prep Athletics Podcast. We just found out before the call, Ryan and I uh, are a year apart and went to rival high school. So we've probably seen each other at a party back in the mid 90s and didn't even know it. So it's, it's always good to talk to uh, fellow Kentuckians and, and Tom and I, uh, Tom's been on the podcast before with AAU and uh, Tom's the reason this podcast even exists. So it's good to talk to you guys and, and share your thoughts. Um, real quick, if you guys enjoyed this, be sure, be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. We got all the podcasts plus bonus content. Uh, this podcast can be found on all the major podcasting platforms. If you guys have any questions on NILs, there'll be uh, links in the show notes to these two guys, or you can always reach out to me with any questions. 
And uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Ryan, Tom, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thank you, Corey. And we'll see you guys in the next episode here in the Prep Athletics Podcast. Have a good day. Bye.